Six weeks after Hamas's attacks on October 7th, Israel continues its bombardment and siege of Gaza. While Israel's response has had the full support of the majority of European countries, some dissenting voices are making themselves heard and calling for a ceasefire. So what role is Europe playing in the Israel-Gaza war? And how has its support for Israel changed over time? I'll ask renowned economist and former Greek finance minister Yanis Varoufakis in an Upfront special. Yanis Varoufakis, thank you so much for joining me on Upfront. Uh, it has been six weeks since Hamas's attack on October 7th uh, and the start of Israel's bombardment of Gaza. Uh, the vast majority of European governments were unequivocally supportive of Israel, uh, as well as its response. Uh, but in recent days, Belgium's deputy prime minister has called for sanctions against Israel. And French uh, President Emmanuel Macron has called to, quote, work towards a ceasefire. Are we seeing a shift in the positions of European governments? Tragically, it has taken more than 11,000 deaths to see a minute shift a shift which is so late coming and so small that, as Europeans, we should hang our heads in shame. Hang our heads in shame. What do you think should have been the initial response? Like, on October 8th, what should the European uh, Union, what should European states have been saying? The thing that logic dictates, which is beyond condemnations. We all condemn war crimes. We all condemn horrible, horrible things that have been done to Israeli citizens, to um, Thai citizens by Hamas, to Palestinians by settlers in the West Bank. But, you know, let's move on beyond condemnation, because we Europeans have created this problem. We've created centuries of anti-Semitism, pogroms against the people uh, that came originally from that land, the Jews. And then we subjected them to the Holocaust. Then we supported the vile dogma or dictum of a land without a people for a people without a land, as if Palestine was empty of people. This is settler, white, supremacist language. The British use this in Australia to declare Australia terra nullius, an empty land, empty of people in order to justify the genocide of uh, the Aborigines in Australia, and not just in Australia, they did it in Kenya, they did it in South Africa. Uh, and, you know, in the 1920s and 30s, the process began by which Europe was trying to get rid of its guilt over the pogroms against the Jews, maybe get rid of the Jews from Europe, by supporting uh, a genocidal against the Palestinians this time, dictum and narrative. This has been going on for 80 years. So what should have happened at the beginning of October? It's really very simple. We should have demanded the end of the state of apartheid, which creates two different legal systems on the same small patch of land between two different peoples. That is the source of all violence, violence for decades. Uh, we have a prime minister in uh, Israel whose uh, raison d'etre, the whole point of his existence, was to destroy the peace process. Netanyahu uh, has one objective in life, to make sure that there is never a two-state solution, the solution that Joe Biden advocates, Emmanuel Macron advocates. So this is what we should have done. Condemn all acts of violence, and at the same time say to both sides, to both extremes, we are not going to tolerate this, there is going to be a peace process under the United Nations. There is going to be a complete clampdown on all kinds of violence, whether it's settler violence in the West Bank by Israelis or Hamas violence against Israelis. And we're going to sort this mess out once and for all. Well, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen proposed a kind of vision of moving forward that engages some of the ideas that you just mentioned. Uh, she offered five principles to guide the future of the Gaza Strip. Uh, those include no safe haven for terrorists, no Hamas-led government, no long-term Israeli security presence, no forced displacement of Palestinians, and no sustained blockade. Uh, what do you make of the proposal, and does it fully represent uh, what the European people want? Well, Mrs. Ursula von der Leyen represents no one. She essentially violated all principles of European democratic process by 
flying to Israel and effectively cheerleading the war crimes of Israel in the Gaza Strip. As for the precise <laughs> proposal, which comes, I have to say that, we, we have a duty not to take Mrs. Ford the Lion seriously. DiEM25, the movement that I'm part of, we have a campaign and a petition for her removal and dismissal. She's an embarrassment to Europeans. She doesn't speak for Europeans. She shouldn't be there. She, we should get rid of her as quickly as possible. Having said that, let's take the five points you mentioned. Essentially, what she's doing is she's playing the game of Netanyahu of destroying the two-state solution by isolating Gaza from the broader problem of how to have two states living side by side, or if we want to be more humanist and more ambitious, to talk about a single state that is secular and does not discriminate between Jews and, uh, and Palestinians. She doesn't do that. She separates Gaza and says, let's find a solution for Gaza, not a solution for the apartheid state in West Bank. Because you see, allow me to ask a rhetorical question. What if Hamas were to just disappear, you know, surrender to the idea today? What happens then? What happens in the West Bank, where we have settlers, as we speak, uh, throwing out, terrorizing, killing, murdering, maiming Palestinians and throwing them off their ancestral land? You have a Palestinian authority that has been completely humiliated and deprived of any authority over the West Bank. And you have a government which clearly says that they are going to annex the whole thing from the river to the sea. What is Mrs. von der Leyen's suggestion for that? Just deal with Gaza. That is to become the useful idiot of Benjamin Netanyahu. That's who Mrs. Ursula von der Leyen is. That's why we Europeans must band together and get rid of her. Earlier you talked about uh, it, Europe's long history in uh, the hatred of Jews, the prosecution and persecution of Jews, violence against Jews. Is this Holocaust guilt that leads to this place of sort of not pushing back sufficiently against Israel's policies and practices? I'm, I'm asking that partly because there's a, a poll conducted by Politico in 2021 uh, it found that 41% of those polled in Europe agreed that, quote, against the background of the history of the Holocaust, Europe bears a special responsibility for Israel. Now, 39% disagree, but 20% don't know. I mean, that's a sizable number of people. And so it makes me wonder if that informs their decision to not more strongly condemn Israel's actions. Partly, yes. Look, there is a very good reason why we Europeans bear the guilt over the Holocaust. It is because we are responsible for it. Not just the German Nazis, the Croat Nazis, the Greek Nazis, uh, the Hungarian Nazis, the French Nazis, or the collaborators. We all played a small part, not individually, but in terms of our culture, in terms of our nations, in uh, that uniquely evil event in, in the history of the world, of humanity, called the Holocaust. But the question I put to my fellow Europeans, especially to my German friends, and I mean that as friends, is this. How far must Israel's ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians proceed before our justified guilt over the Holocaust no longer prevents us from challenging Israel's ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians? So to put it a bit more brutally, how much Palestinian blood do we need to wash off the guilt of the Holocaust? So it's, a, it's a provocative question. Uh, a week after Hamas's attack on Israeli civilians, you refused to condemn either Hamas or Netanyahu committing atrocities across Israel-Palestine. Instead of condemning either, you condemned Europeans and Americans, as you're doing very much today, as the true villains who have been, quote, making peace impossible in Israel-Palestine. Is it really fair to offset all of these war crimes onto the West? Uh, however guilty we all may be, shouldn't Hamas and the Israeli government also be held accountable for their actions? Of course they should be. But allow me to say that I am a European. If I were Indian or Chinese or South African or Latin American, I wouldn't be saying what I said. But as a European, I am refusing to play the phony game that other Europeans play, especially our governments, who are condescending they are looking at the people who now are suffering, both Israelis and Palestinians, and Bedouins and Druze in the land of ancient Palestine. Think of what we Europeans do. 
you know, we look down upon those people and say, oh, you know, you um, animals, you are killing each other. We're going to condemn you. Whether we condemn, you know, the Hamas people or the settlers or the Tanyahu or the PLO, in the end, we Europeans look down upon them as if we are superior. We're not superior. We're infinitely inferior. We, over centuries, have created colonialism, we have created anti-Semitism, we have created the mentality of imperialism. We are behind the massacres that are being uh, carried out by both sides. So we are the last people on this planet, in this universe, who have the authority, the moral right, the high ethical standards that would allow us to look down upon these people and condemn them. I'm not going to play this game anymore. I condemn every war crime. But you know what? To those who say to me, why are you not condemning Hamas? I say to them, well, you lost your opportunity to ask me this question. The moment you fail to condemn the killing of unarmed journalists, uh, Palestinian journalists, non-Palestinian journalists, Israeli journalists, Israeli Jewish peace activists, children, women, old men, You've lost the moment you forgot, you neglected to condemn that. Uh, let's not play this condemnation game anymore. Let's just ask the, the very simple question. Do we or do we not want to see? From the river to the sea, <laughs> and I use this expression provocatively, do we want to see from the river to the sea? I don't care about Israel, Palestine, or anything. Do we want to see people who live without the fear of being killed with equal civil and political rights? What has happened in the United States in particular? Have we forgotten the great civil rights marches in the 1960s? Why can't we have the same mentality about the land of Palestine and start with one assumption that should be common amongst civilized women, men, transgender, whatever we happen to be? And that is that there should be no discrimination, no apartheid in that land. How we're going to work it out, whether there will be two states, multi-ethnic states sitting side by side, or one state for everyone that doesn't discriminate between Jews, Bedouins, Druze, Palestinians, Arabs, and so on, I don't care. Let's begin with this. Uh, in the past few weeks, we've seen some of the biggest pro-Palestine marches ever recorded, both in Europe and in the United States. Uh, has there been a shift in the public's attitude toward Palestinians? And if so, will this lead to any kind of substantive government positions changing? Not really. What we have seen is a truer expression of the feelings out there in our communities. The people of Europe in the majority have traditionally traditionally recognized the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians since the Nakba, since 1948. The majority of the French, the majority of the Germans, the majority of the Greeks, we always understood, because it's the obvious thing to understand, that there was an attempt ethnically to cleanse a people. But I do not see our governments shifting fast enough so that uh, we will be able in the future to answer our grandchildren when they ask us, what did you do when the thousands of children in Gaza were being massacred in cold blood? What some governments have done in response has been to ban protesting. Yes. Uh, France, Germany, Hungary, Austria have all banned solidarity protests with Palestine. Other European leaders have tried to delegitimize them, framing them all as anti-Semitic or extremist events. Uh, one German MP even suggested stripping non-EU nationals of their right to protest. Uh, how dangerous is this backlash for European civil rights and the global Palestinian rights movement as a whole? Well, let me ask, answer your pertinent question with an example. A few days ago, a friend who happens to be an Israeli Jew who lives in Berlin studied very carefully the German constitution to establish what her constitutional rights as a resident of Germany are. And she discovered that the police cannot ban her from doing a one-person demonstration, that is, standing in the middle of a square with a placard which read, as an Israeli and as a Jew, I say, stop the genocide of Palestinians. And she was arrested. Need I say more? 
The moment we allow this to happen, the moment we allow our police force, our parliaments, our instruments and organs of the state to tell an Israeli Jew in the middle of Berlin that she's being arrested because of a, the expression of a view which not, was not, not even spoken, but it was written on a placard, that is a very slippery slope to two things. Morbid anti-Semitism. Here you have a white German policeman arresting a Jewish woman who happens to be Israeli as well in Berlin. And the second thing that happens is the end of civil liberties for all of us. Since the uh, October 7th attacks, there's also been a rise in anti-Semitism across Europe. We've seen Molotov cocktails thrown on a synagogue in Germany. We've seen stars of David sprayed on residential buildings uh, in France. Uh, there was a Jewish cemetery desecrated in Austria. This is all very worrisome stuff. Uh, however, some accusations of anti-Semitism have been against people who are simply criticizing Israel's human rights record. For example, uh, in response to Amnesty International stating that war crimes uh, had been committed by all parties, Lior Hayat, the spokesperson for the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs, called Am Amnesty International anti-Semitic and a, quote, propaganda organization that's working for Hamas terrorists. How does one thread the needle between dismissing the idea that all support for Palestine is anti-Semitic without delegitimizing the fact that there is a very real rise in anti-Semitic hate crimes against Jewish people going on right as we speak? Whenever you have a tragedy like the one unfolding in the land of Palestine, in Israel today, the extremes are the great beneficiaries. On the one hand, the gross anti-Semites, and on the other, uh, the other hand, the gross um, hate, you know, haters of Palestinians. Uh, allow me to answer by means of a personal story. I grew up in a fascist dictatorship here in Greece. We had colonels running the ministries. They were abominable. They were imprisoning Greek Democrats. We lived in fear for seven years of the earlier part of my life. Now, whenever a foreigner, the German chancellor at the time, Willy Brandt, a great man, criticized the Greek government, he was being accused by the Greek fascists in power here in Athens as being anti-Greek, hmm. a mishellenist, right? The equivalent of anti-Semite. Uh, whenever a Greek confronted the fascist government, the fascist government, Talked to him, uh, talked about him as a Greek hating Greek. This is what we have now happening across the world. There is a concerted propaganda effort to identify, to equate opposition to Netanyahu's fascist government and to the apartheid state that he has so successfully created with anti Semitism. The moment you conflate the two, an objection to a fascist regime <laughs> which oppresses Jewish intellectuals, Jewish Democrats, just as much as it oppresses anyone else. The moment you identify that criticism of that regime with anti-Semitism, that is the greatest victory of anti-Semites. And to go back to the previous example with uh, Iris uh, Hafez, the uh, psychoanalyst, uh, the woman that I referred to in Berlin, the Israeli Jew that uh, was arrested for protesting, uh, isn't that the height of anti-Semitism? To have a white German police officer arresting an Israeli Jew in Berlin? Now, a lot of Europe's far-right parties are providing unequivocal support for Israel at the moment. But those same parties often have a deep and long history of anti-Semitism themselves. For example, you have um, Marine Le Pen's National Rally Party in France, which fully supported Israel. But the party was founded by a former SS member. And another founder, Le Pen's own father, was convicted for minimizing the Holocaust. Many have pointed towards similar trends among far-right parties uh, in Hungary and in Poland and other places. How do you make sense of these trends where far-right parties have these incredibly powerful pro-Israel views, but also deep histories of anti-Semitism. Well, this is a worldwide phenomenon. It happens here in Greece, too. We have Nazis who were um, campaigning actively uh, on anti-Semitic 
tropes. They were even selling those disgusting pamphlets and volumes uh, about Sion and so on, the conspiracy theories against the Jews. Uh, and now they are, you know, they are wearing the Israeli flag and egging on the idea of to kill as many Palestinians as possible. You have this in the United States. You have an evangelical movement, which is extremely right wing. It was extremely anti-Semitic for 200 years in the United States. And suddenly they have made the extreme Zionist position, the messianic position, whereby God supposedly is going to reappear in the land of Palestine. And that needs, that needs, that makes it necessary to expand all the Palestinians <laughs> from that land. Uh, the, the, this is a worldwide phenomenon. It's a very interesting one. I think that, you know, sociologists, uh, psychanalysts, psychiatrists are going to have a field day for the next <laughs> hundred years explaining it. But what, what we see, what we see is, you see that re really very simple flip of a switch from a rabid anti-Semitism to rabid Islamo Islamophobia. Because in the end, what the ultra-right needs is a group of people to demonize. It so happened that it was the Jews. Now it can be anything. It can be the Syrians, it can be the Palestinians, it can be, you know, the Belgians. It doesn't really matter. They need a, 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 a scapegoat. They need to be able to point at the people to say, if these people were eradicated, life would be easier. This is what Goebbels did in the 1920s and 1930s so successfully with the Jews being targeted and being the victims. Today is happening in France. Uh, by the same people who were targeting the Jews, they are now targeting um, Algerians and Moroccans and so on. So the greatest enemy is a fascism that requires scapegoats. The fact that they go, the flip-flop between different target groups is not the issue. Hmm. I want to ask you about something else. Um, European countries have long been involved with sending weapons to Israel. The Stockholm International Peace Research Institute found that Italy and Germany have supplied Israel's military with crucial weapons and equipment that is now being used on the ground in Gaza. The UK has helped bolster the Israeli Air Force, while Germany has sent tanks to Israel as well. Uh, there's a lot of awareness of U.S. military aid to Israel. We talk about it all the time. We talk about the billions that we send. But how underplayed is Europe's direct military assistance to Israel? Severely. And it takes uh, two forms. You mentioned one form, selling Israel weaponry. But there is a second form, buying weaponry from Israel. Because Israel is a major producer of weaponry as well. And not just lethal weaponry, but also spyware. Think of Predator. So, you know, my government here in Greece, the, the government of the um, conservative party that I oppose, they purchased Predator and they've used it against their political opponents. They even use it to spy on one another. So Israel's uh, location in the international trade of uh, surveillance and uh, lethal weaponry is, 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 is a very important location. And Europe is uh, an active supporter of this. Now, to those who are watching us and within, yes, but Europe must help Israel survive. My message to you folks is Israel is not in danger. Hamas, yes, they have a capacity to inflict a lot of pain on Israel. But it is not a present and clear danger for the Israeli state. Israel is a tremendously powerful state. It's a nuclear armed state. It's got an army uh, armed to the teeth and technologically incredibly advanced. There is no way that the Israeli army can lose to anyone. Only the Palestinians are being ethnically cleansed. And they are very clear guidelines by the Israeli government, supported by the West, to get rid of them, fully to eradicate them from the Gaza Strip, from East Jerusalem, and from the West Bank. Yanis Varoufakis, thank you so much for joining me in up front. Appreciate your insights as always. Well, thank you.